that's a calculus three chain rule. So what's the Jacobian of f? I should emphasize here, if you go from Rn to Rm, the Jacobian of f at a is m by n. It's an m by n matrix. So what we're looking for here, 1 by 3, actually. It goes, it goes backwards. The Jacobian then is partial f, partial x, partial f, partial y, partial f, partial z. That's the Jacobian of f. What's the Jacobian of r? 3 by 1. Maybe you recognize it. Um, I guess I need some notation for r. I mean, it's partial. I mean, <laughs> you could say partial r, partial t, but usually when we just have one independent variable, we don't use the partial notation. We just say that's dr dt. So that's our notation for one, you know, one variable. We just use ddt there. So what happens when you multiply the Jacobian of f times the Jacobian of r, right? That should be the Jacobian of f composed with r. That's what the chain rule. Here's the note. Here's the chain rule written in Jacobian notation. Which is, <laughs> see what that is? <laughs> and um, I guess if I if I say r is, say x y z. So then you got like dx dt dy dt, dz dt. Sorry, my marker is kind of getting scrunt. It's getting yucky. And, well, it's not really dead yet. It's I'm, I'm fine. A little bit better than Better for throws markers too. Yeah. Oh, when he gets mad. No, the last one hit Matt. Oh, he hit Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. Ah. Funny. So as you I mean that is exactly the dot product of the gradient and, and that. This one's very significant by the way, because if, if you have if you have f um, you know if you have f of r of t equals to some constant, right? For example, you might have f of x, y, z equals to x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals to 1. Well, that's a sphere, right? And so to say that f of r of t is equal to 1 is to say that the space curve falls on the sphere. And then this chain rule, what's saying is that the gradient of f at the point r of t dotted with dr dt is equal to 0, which is to say that if you have a parameterization of a, of a space curve, which falls on some level surface, then the, the tangent, the velocity vector for that space curve is perpendicular to the normal to the, the surface. This follows, I mean, this, this, this little observation is, this, is, the, is the jumping off point for the whole theory of Lagrange multipliers. That's another day, though. Let me show you how to do it a calculus one example in a very non-calculus one way. Do you guys remember how we differentiate x to the x? How do we differentiate x to the x in calculus one? Yeah, we take you take the log, you, you do implicit differentiation, right? Yeah, yeah. Let me show you a, a really different way to do it. So x to the x. Hmm. How, do, how, do, how do you differentiate this, right? Now, I totally agree with you. What you just said is fine. We can use implicit differentiation. That's good. But let me show you another way. Consider the function f of uh, x comma y equals to x to the y. Right? Um, then if you look at f of um, 
r of t, right, equals to t to the t. You can get this from what? From r of t is equal to what? Yeah, t comma t. So I, I can I can look at x to the x as the as the problem of differentiating the composite of f and this this r of t. So d dt of f of r of t is what? Well, as we just said, it's the gradient of f at r of t, right? Dotted with dr dt. Now what's what's the gradient of f here? So the gradient of f, right? It's right. So I'm I'm writing it as a vector here. So fine, let me do it. I'll use my vector notation. So vector partial f partial x, right? Partial f partial y. What's partial f partial x? Okay, yeah. What's partial y? Very good. Now, of course, we are assuming what? We are assuming that natural log of x times x to the y. So to write that, I'm assuming x is positive, right? So there you go. You've got y x to the y minus 1, comma, natural log of x times x to the y. Dot. And, and of course, all of that's evaluated at x equals to t, y equals to t, right? And you're taking the dot product with the derivative of dr dt, which is just 1, 1, right? So I, I have to evaluate that first vector at the inside function, which gives me what? t, t to the t minus 1, natural log of t, t to the t, <laughs> dot 1, 1, which gives me what? t to the t plus ln t, t to the t. And there you have it. But this is illustrative of a more general technique of differentiation. When you're faced with a derivative you don't know how to do because you've got, in this case we have x appearing in two different ways that we don't, there's no, you know, we know how to do it if x is one place or if x is the other place. We don't know how to do it if x is both. So what you do is you just invent a new function where you separate the role of those two x's, into x and y. And then you, you can use this notion of chain rule to do the differentiation, assuming that the variables are independent. Well, once you're done with the differentiation, then you can put back the, the dependence of x and y, and so, and so discover the derivative. This is a general technique. Yeah, if we, if we, well, okay, so, I mean, changing the, yeah, okay, finally, yeah, okay, fine, right, so then to, tra I, I see your point, um, so to get to the end, of course, we just translate to x, right? Yeah, just t to x, so that's, that's 1 plus ln of x. I factored out the x to the x just to make it pretty, but. Now on the, on the course planner, I originally had chain rule and product, product rules galore today, but we did the product rules galore last time, right? Now I can, I'm not, um, well, let me just give you a view ahead of what we're going to do. All right, so first of all, we're, we're going to be, we're, we'll, we'll be in this world, all right? There, I, there's, you'll have a few more homeworks on the norm linear space stuff, but our, our, our focus, our, our major theorems from this point on out will be in Rn. Um, so I think next class, what's on the roster is what? Anybody have the course schedule handy? I looked at it, but I can't remember which day I'm, I don't know if I'm remembering next week or if I'm remembering next, 
next class when I tell you. Ah. You guys are leaving me hanging here. Ah. Oh well. Yeah, it's it's online. Well, let me just. Let me just so I'm, I think what I do next is to discuss with you the um, intuitive versions of the implicit and inverse function theorems. So, essentially, the point is this. It turns out that the local behavior of the linearization is very uh, indicative of what the function does near the point. So, in short, a function is going, we're going to be able to show that a function is basically invertible. It's locally invertible at a point. And I'm saying a function from Rn to Rm, all right? We could be talking about a function from R5 to R whatever. It's locally invertible if the linearization is invertible. Uh, and likewise, you know, you could say things about the implicit function theorem basically is when you solve for one variable in terms of other, others. Again, we'll be able to essentially replace the, the generic nonlinear problem, linear, linearize the problem, and if we can solve the problem for the linearization, it turns out that at least locally you can solve the problem for the nonlinear function itself. That, in a nutshell, is what the inverse and implicit function theorems tell you. And here they tell you that you can study the problem by looking at the linearization rather than looking at the, the function itself. It's really as simple as that. And the proof of those things, is, it's rather involved if you do the full bore analysis for it, but when you get down to the, you know, the really the intuitive uh, truth of the matter is you just essentially replace the function with linearization and do just plain old linear algebra on it. And that's what I'll do next time in part, I think, if I remember right. Yay, I remembered right. So that's what's on the, on the thing. And then next Tuesday, we'll talk about the problem of tangent spaces and normal spaces. Next Tuesday, I'll breathe geometry into what we're doing. I'll talk about what, what in the world does this, this you know, f prime of a have to do with what's the analog of a tangent line in what we're doing, right? I've just been talking about operationally that it's good for finding a linearization for the function. In fact, it's also intimately tied to the geometry um, in higher dimensions. Like, what does it mean to have a tangent space to, the, to these, well, level spaces? Um, and so forth. And then also uh, the flip side of that is to talk about what's, what takes over as the analog to the normal line. You know, if we have a three-dimensional surface in a six-dimensional space, it turns out the tangent space will be three-dimensional, but the normal space will also be three-dimensional. And so there's this kind of complementarity that goes on. It's, 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 and it, it's, this, it's essentially the orthogonal complement stuff in linear. So at that point, I will take some time to review the theory of orthogonal complements from linear algebra, because I know some of you didn't see it in linear. So I'll take 10 minutes and we'll, it's not hard actually. If you can do a row reduction, you already have all the tools you need to calculate orthogonal complements. And that's it, that's where we're going. So by the first test, we should pretty well know how to linearize things and do these kinds of calculations. So, thanks guys. And I do, obviously, you can cut it off.